Hello and welcome to the Second Tier Podcast. I'm Ryan Dilks and I'm joined by the EFL Awards to my Second Tier Awards. It's Justin Peach. Good day to you, Ryan. Yes, that's right, baby. It's the Second Tier Awards season and that means today we're revealing our Second Tier Team of the season. Me and Justin are suited and booted for the occasion. We've got our blazers on. It's the only time of year where I don't feel daft for putting a blazer on for the podcast, Justin. Yeah, yeah. Of all the other times we put blazers on for the podcast, and you know, we, we tell each other, "Don't." Let's not wear one today. You know, we're recording on a Sunday morning. We don't need to. We don't need to mm. on a random December morning. But you're absolutely right. I feel I feel great. I mean, I've got a smart casual look. I'm not going to lie. I've got my blazer, I've got my shirt, and I'm wearing You're shorts good, and no bro. socks. Looking Thank you, good, bro. Looking good. Thank you. But of course, I'm wearing shorts and socks as a true football fan. <laughs> I'm wearing joggers. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. No but one needs to that, see the bottom. No one needs to see that. Uh, but if you're if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll of course be able to see that we are wearing, you know, suit and tie, what have you. Uh, well, not a tie, but you know, suit. Um, but I'm glad that the podcast listeners are now able to understand how seriously we are taking this because mm. these are the real deal, aren't they, Justin? These awards yeah. are the true awards. Forget the EFL awards; they're tin pot. These are the ones that actually matter. Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. There's, there's the, you know, everyone makes a big deal about the Oscars. Um, everyone makes a big deal about you know, Academy Awards, PFA Awards. Same thing. Oscar exactly. and Academy Awards are the same thing. <laughs> I meant uh, Football Academy Awards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so dim sometimes. It's incredible. Um, yeah, everyone makes a big deal about the PFA Awards, the EFL Awards, Football League Awards. Uh, probably the same thing again. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But these are these are the pinnacle. These are two people in spare bedrooms of their of their uh, respective homes giving out awards to people who will never ever know about them. Exactly. And this is what matters. This is what matters. <laughs> That's why they're so prestigious. <laughs> oh, Justin, well, we are championship experts, aren't we? And when, when it comes to the EFL awards, I do often find they are a bit politically motivated yes. sometimes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Whereas this, we we give the true perspective of. Like you know, we've watched so much championship football this season, probably more than your average um, fan, even yeah. of a championship yeah. side. Um, and here we are; we can give a genuinely neutral perspective of who has been the best of the best this season. Absolutely. So, you know what? Let's fucking get on to it. Welcome to the number one championship podcast, the second tier. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. Yes, today we are revealing our team of the season in the championship, and then tomorrow we'll be revealing our individual awards, like you know, player of the season, young player of the season, manager of the season, etc, etc. But today we're just talking about who has been the best players in their respective positions this season. So without further ado, let's bloody get on to it. Justin, can you reveal for us the first player in our team of the season, which unsurprisingly is the goalkeeper? I I feel we should surprise everybody and just go for a a central midfielder and a completely screw up the formation. That would just be confusing. Let's not do that. It'd be chaos. You're all right. It is the goalkeeper we're starting with. And the the goalkeeper we've picked this season is Angus Gunn of Norwich City. Mm. Now, the the interesting thing about Norwich is that defensively haven't been fantastic this season, which given David Wagner's track record at Huddersfield, they were pretty pretty decent. They kept teams out. They nil-niled their way all the way to the Premier League. And that was, a, that, was a, that was a catalyst for them. Actually, this Norwich team concedes a lot of goals. They're in the top 10 for goals conceded. Or sorry, the 10th for goals conceded in the Championship this season, despite coming sixth. So why would we pick Angus Gunn if he's conceded a lot of goals? Well, if he, if, they had, yeah, if he had a good defence in front of him, things would be a lot better for Norwich. But for me, Angus Gunn has been an unreal shot stopper for Norwich City this season and a, a key key driver in allowing them to get into the playoffs. As I say, that defence isn't great. They conceded a lot of chances last season. Angus Gunn was a uh, was a key performer for the Canaries. He's, a top, he's in the top six for save percentage with 71%, which again is a really, really good feat to have. And the quality of shots he's faced as well, he ranks third in terms of stopping those chances, basically dumbing down XG for the, uh, for the listener. He's just a reliable shot stopper. Uh, and for a team that hasn't, as I say, hasn't been amazing defensively, he's been really really consistent for Norwich probably probably the most consistent goalkeeper throughout uh, the championship this campaign which is why we've picked him yeah I think a few people will be quite surprised at us picking Angus Gunn in goal and there I've got to I've got to start out by saying I don't think there's been a particularly standout keeper in the division no. this season but Angus Gunn is someone who I think has been massively 
overlooked from other team of the seasons, which I've seen, because he's not put a foot wrong this season and has been regularly making big saves for Norwich. You're right, they're not the best side at the back. So he's been called upon several times, but every time I've seen him, he's just so solid, very reliable. If yeah. you want to look at it from a data perspective, it's Gunn, Mads Hermanson at Leicester and Carl Rushworth at Swansea, who are by far and away the best in the division in terms of the goals prevented stat, which is arguably the, the best way to measure yeah. a goalkeeper's shot stopping. And while Hermanson and Rushworth have been great this season, I've also seen them make a few mistakes. Angus Gunn, I can't recall a single error he's made all season. I'm sure someone will now flag up to me after this, but <laughs> they're, far, they're few and far between in whatever the case, aren't they? So I think he's a really underrated keeper and probably, well, in fact, I, I will go as far to say he has been the best keeper in the division this season. That's why he's in this team um, and fully deserving of his place in this team. And I'm glad you agree with me, Justin. Well, I said it first, so you agree with me, Ryan. But... I think we made the team together. <laughs> but I said it first. <laughs> um, and I think a really, really important point to make is Norwich struggled, really, really struggled, didn't they? In this sort of the, I wouldn't say middle third of the season, but sort of second quarter of the season where they were being hammered. Fans were up against the team. They wanted David Wagner out. Um, ben Napper was under pressure because of the mess Stuart Webber left behind. Angus Gunn kept that Norwich team in games at times. And as well as that, Josh Sargent being injured meant other players had to step up. One of those players was Angus Gunn, albeit being a goalkeeper, but he kept scores level. He kept scores down. He kept Norwich in games. And that is why he's here. Yeah, he's won individual points this season, which I think is the biggest compliment you can ever give a goalkeeper. Um, Honourable mentions, we will be going through each position and saying some honourable mentions as we go through this team. Vaclav Hladke at Ipswich has had a brilliant season, um, not just shaving, saving shots, but with the ball at his feet as well. Alex Palmer at West Brom's had a great season. Mads yeah. Hermanson at Leicester as well. Some honourable mentions there in the goalkeeping department. But let's move on to right back. And our first outfielder in this team is Cal Walker-Peters of Southampton. Now, now, Cal Walker-Peters is in a group of players who shouldn't really be playing in the championship because they're simply too good. But he has been and he's regularly shown that he should be playing in the Premier League. I was quite surprised to see that he's only got two goals and four assists this season. I <laughs> thought he would have more because he's so influential going forwards. However, I never for a moment wasn't including him in this team because he has been so influential for Southampton to be you know, as big of an influence on a team as he is from right back is quite impressive. But it's true, he's absolutely top class, whether that's running at defenders, his passing, his passing is remarkable. He's the ideal fullback for a Russell Martin team because he's such an intelligent player, just an absolute baller. And I think Southampton fans know if they don't go up in the playoffs, they'll do well to hold on to him, Justin. Yeah. I think the interesting thing as well, I'm just looking at his passing numbers, his pass success rate is 91%. In a Russell Martin team, it can be skewed um, because they pass and pass and pass and pass and pass. So naturally, those statistics are going to be higher. But for a right back to have a pass success rate of 91%, bearing in mind, they're going to put in a lot of crosses that don't meet target. They're going to be trying things in um, other areas of the pitch that centre-backs wouldn't try, for example. So to have a pass percentage rate of 91% at right-back is incredible efficiency and also quality and um, decision-making, you know, picking out those right passes. He is 27. Just, I, will, I will just jump in there as well. Um, people may be listening to that and thinking 91%. Well, he's probably just passing sideways all the time, but I can tell you he does he's not. I yeah. think I'm right in saying, I haven't got this down in front of me, I think he's rated third in the division for progressive passes, which mm-hmm. is you know passing the ball 10 yards nearer to the opposition goal that just goes to show that he's not just passing it sideways he's making things happen into yeah exactly and I think to have a, a wing back to do that I think is such an asset to um, to Southampton uh, going forward and I think as, uh, what's interesting tactically as well is yes he does a lot of overlapping and underlapping to get in behind defences but when uh, you know, Southampton are with the ball sometimes he sits centrally as well so you've got to be composed on the ball um, and it's a very important facet to have in a, in a possession based team that, that right back sitting in um, into sort of a, you know, a three, either a, a sort of a, an extra man in midfield or you know extra extra man in, in a wide area so yeah Kyle Walker-Peters has by far been the best right back in the league tactically by far the best right back in the league um, technically by far the best right back in the league so there's no surprise he's in here because he's matched it with his performances as well 
Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, Justin. Some honourable mentions. I'll tell you what, the standard of right-backs in the division this season has actually been really high, which I think is just an even bigger compliment to Carl Walker-Peters. Um, honourable mentions, Perry NG at Cardiff has had a yeah. phenomenal season. Yeah. Um, for a pretty unremarkable Cardiff team, but has stood out on so many occasions. Ricardo Pereira fits into the same category as KWP. He does. Just a Premier League player. And Trey Hume as well, you may remember, was included in our halfway team this season. Yeah. But, you know, with Sunderland and the season, the end of the season that they've had, has unfortunately fallen out of recognition um, as far as our team of the season goes, but still very high standard of right backs in the Championship this season. Let's go through to our first centre back in the team, Justin. Who have we got there? We've got a Leeds United man, surprisingly, given their drop off towards the end of the season, but nonetheless, and Joe Roden has been phenomenal all campaign. He's been an ever present for Leeds. In addition to that, just his just his all round quality and ability and it as a defer defender is incredible. And now it's not really a surprise given he was schooled at Swansea back when they were a really good possession based team um before fluctuating managers came in and changed things. But he has everything you need in a centre back and he showed that time and time again for Leeds. He saw he was comfortable with the ball, as we know, aerially very, very good. Interceptions and reading of game situations also very good and really consistent. I think the, the interesting thing that I was looking back at, at numbers because I think Joe Roden was the first name that sort of came to my head. Not Ethan Ampadu, Joe Roden in terms of picking a centre half. Um, yeah, he was a, he was the first name that came to my head when when choosing this team of the season. Um, and when looking back at the numbers, some defenders are just good at certain things. Like Jake Cooper's aerial numbers are insane. He's the best in the division for winning headers. No surprising because he's the same size as a skyscraper. But Joe Roden, but there are other things he's not good at. Joe Roden has a collective attribute as a centre-back. He's got everything. And wherever Leeds are next season, they have to try to bring him in in the summer because he's so bloody good. And I think um, I think he can really make it home at Leeds because that move to Spurs has been uh, almost a disaster for him. So yeah, Joe Roden's in this team. Um, it's been, been a catalyst for Leeds keeping clean sheets and a big reason as to why Leeds even had a shout of the, uh, of the title come sort of three or four games before the end of the season. Yeah, well, I think if you ask many Leeds fans, they'll tell you Roden's been their player of the season. Hmm. And one of the main reasons why Leeds looked like they may win the league at one point was because they were so ridiculously solid at the back around the new year. One goal conceded in 13 games is it's just mad, isn't it? Yeah. I don't think we'll see a defensive record like that for a long time in the Championship. And they've conceded the second fewest goals in the division in total. The one constant in defence for Leeds United has been Joe Roden. Since signing, he's only missed two games. The guy is an absolute warrior, but also great on the ball too, as you have to be in a Daniel Farker team, obviously. But he's not put a foot wrong all season. Um, and when you're playing the way he is in a Daniel Farker team. You, you'd have thought he would you know, put a, a foot wrong every so often and make a clanger here or there, but he honestly hasn't. And then defensively, he's just been absolutely sensational. A real unsung hero yeah. in this lead side, Justin Inti. That's the big thing. That's the big thing. Because as I say, um, I, I, it almost feels like I'm throwing shade at Ethan Ampadu because he was picked in the EFL team of this season despite only playing half the games at centre-back. but It wasn't even half, uh, Justin. It was less than that. Yeah. No, Ethan Ampadu has been quality this season, but he's been he's been great in central midfield and he's been great in, in, in at centre-back, but it doesn't mean he's been the better centre-back. Um, and I think that's why Joe Roden was, was cruelly overlooked because I think he was, he's been by far the most consistent centre-back or one of the most consistent centre-backs in the division this season. And, and again, a big reason why Leeds were removed a shout of, of, of being automatically promoted was because of those clean sheets and how solid they were. Joe Roden was an ever ever present in that um, in that team. So yeah, to, to overlook him for any other team of the season, I think would be would be a, a great shame. He should be in there. Yeah, I, I was very shocked when he wasn't included in the official EFL team of the season. But that goes to show why they're absolutely tin pot. Just then, let's go on to our next centre back. We've gone with Yannick Vestergaard at Leicester City. Now, it definitely won't be one of the biggest stories of the season, but the comeback of Yannick Vestergaard <laughs> has been remarkable. Prior to the start of last season, it had been one year and four months since he last played a league game for Leicester. That is insane, isn't it? He had been completely frozen out by Brendan Rodgers and was lucky to even make the bench under him. Fast forward to this season, though, and he is another one who's barely put a foot wrong all season. Leicester have the best offensive record in the league, and he's been a key reason for that. He's only missed four games all season and has simply been 
a rock. His defensive partner in Valt Feist has been great all season as well, but he has made a few mistakes along the way. Not big, Yannick. And to top it all off, he's completed the most passes in the division this season out of every single player. You know, stereotypically, a six foot seven centre back struggles to fit into a possession heavy yeah. team. But he's done it brilliantly. So whether it's at the ball at his feet or keeping the goals out, he has done remarkably well this season, anti Justin. Yeah, he has. He's been he's been brilliant. Um he really has. And again he's a player who I was surprised we stepped up because Let's bear in mind that Leicester have got Connor Cody and Harry Souter waiting in the wings. Mm. Um, and he's kept them out. He's kept them out. They have barely had any game time. And it's been an astonishing, astonishing campaign from me, Vestergaard, because as I say, he was, well, as you pointed out, he was he, cast aside. He wasn't, you know, he was, he was you know, on the sidelines. He wasn't anywhere near the squad. So for uh, Maresca to come in and show faith in, in a player who, to be honest, I was unaware of his ability to play with the ball at, you know, with his feet. The way he does, I know he's not. He's probably not as um, adventurous as Wout Feist is, because Wout Feist does like a drive and run forward. But Vestergaard, he just makes the right choices, the right decisions at the right times. He doesn't overcomplicate things. Is exactly what you want in a. Well, would a class him as a ball playing defender? No, but someone who's comfortable yeah. with the ball at his feet. Yeah, he's very, okay. he's very, very accomplished. And I think um, you know he's not play, He's not someone who's going to take risks, and that showed because Leicester have. Only conceded 41 goals this season. The best defensive record in the division. And it's not a surprise because you've got smart players like Vestergaard in that team. Yeah, absolutely right, Justin. Honourable mentions then at centre-back. Cedric Kipre, very unfortunate to miss out on this team um, at West Brom. Jacob Greaves is another one who has had a class season for Hull. Wesley Hoyt, a bit of an underrated player at Watford as well, who I I think many Watford fans would have been campaigning to be included in this team, but uh, unfortunately missed out. And then Vart Feist as well, Yannick Vestergaard's defensive partner, who we mentioned. Um, Go on, Justin. I was going to throw in Steve Cook as well, because... I think he's been astonishing, especially under Sifuentes. But if you're going to judge it on a whole entire season, then maybe not. But certainly under Sifuentes, he's been brilliant. He's definitely had an impact at QPR, hasn't he, with a with a Sifuentes coming in? That's for sure. Justin, we'll have one more player before we have a quick break. And unsurprisingly, it's the final player in our defence. And I don't think this player is going to be a massive shock for who fills the left-back slot, is it? Yeah, it's Leif Davis of Ipswich. Speaks for itself. Done. Move on. Simple. Yeah. Let's get <laughs> to that break. We could do that, but I think, you know, we need to pay tribute to Big Leaf, yeah. don't we? We do, we do. I, look, let's just let's just throw it out there. Don't need to cover this in glory. 18 assists from left back, left wing back. Let's give him some credit. 18 assists. Disgusting. It's illegal. It shouldn't be done. Game-changing moments, game-changing deliveries, consistent from set pieces. The numbers he's posted... As I say, it's just disgusting. He might not be the best defender in the league by any means, but going forwards in an attacking system, my goodness, can he perform. And I'm really, really intrigued to see how he adapts back into the Premier League because he had a couple of opportunities with Leeds, didn't really pay off, but he's stepped up again this season. He's stepped up again. Like every Ipswich player has done this season under Kieran McKenna, he's stepped up and he's been, yeah, another key driver to why Ipswich are in that top two. I think I've said so much about him this season, I can't really say anything more. Yeah, well, I remember at the start of the season and we were both talking up what Davis could do, but I still don't think either of us expected it to go anything like this. The guy has simply been a chance-creating machine. The most chances created in the division. He's averaging a chance created every 30 minutes. To be able to do that from left-back is insane. It's absolutely mad. And sometimes what happens with these players is they create loads of chances, but it doesn't lead to assists. But the quality of chances isn't actually that good. You know, not with our Leaf. 18 assists for the season. It's smashed the previous record for the most assists by a defender in a championship season. And he was only one assist away from equaling the record of most assists in a season by any player, no matter the position. And look, Ipswich have put so much emphasis on his ability with his left foot. I've lost count of the number of times this season where they start an attack with a goalkeeper. He plays it out to Sam Morsey in midfield. He squares it to the right back and suddenly they switch it out to (laughs) Leif Davis and they're on the attack. And he produces all types of assists, you know, crosses, through balls, set pieces. That left foot is absolutely magic and he's got a couple of important goals too the late winner against Bristol City not too long ago the first goal against Southampton as well in that you know season defining game I'm really looking forward to seeing him in the Premier League and 
I'll say it, if he plays regularly, it wouldn't surprise me if he's in the conversation for the England squad next season because, look, we're very short on left-back options at the moment and he can't have done much more this season to, you know, really give himself a platform for even bigger things next season. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to get carried away and say he should be playing for England, but if he does, if he can transform uh, or carry on that form into the Premier League, then then certainly, certainly worth a discussion. Um, but Gareth Southgate being as defensively minded as he is, I think he might, he might over, he cruelly overlook Leif Davis because of his, uh, you know, maybe not as being a good a defender as some. But you are right, we are short. England are short at left back. And he could be, he could be up there. But doesn't take anything away from what he's achieved this season because again I like I don't want to say he was a big reason as to why Ipswich finished in the top two but I think without him Ipswich would have struggled to finish in the top two because as I say those deliveries the chance creators from set pieces the amount of chances he puts on a plate uh, his link up with, with, with Kiefer Moore at times and George Hurst his outlet like you were saying that big switch over to that left flank I don't think anyone else could have performed to that level in consistency than Lee Davis in that team all I'm saying is 2026 World Cup, Leif Davis is going to be giving him on a plate to Harry Kane. Um, so you've heard it here first. <laughs> Just a, let's take a quick break. After that, we'll go into our midfield of our team of the season. Welcome back to the second tier podcast. So we have revealed our goalkeeper and defenders in our team of the season. So it's now time for us to go into midfield. And Justin, can you reveal the identity of our first centre midfielder in our team of the season? I certainly can. The Samba Magic, Gabriel Sara of Norwich City. Any player who gets double-figure goals and assists deserves a chance to at least be considered for a place in any team of the season. So 13 goals and 12 assists gets you a very, very long way. And Gabriel Sara, blimey me, mate. You have been so, so good and consistent. I think the astonishing thing is, last season was a bit of a so-so season for him, adapting into the Championship for Norwich. It was a big, big money signing. One that was met with a little bit of scepticism, even from us, about him settling, about him getting going. And it did take him a good year to get going. But this season for Norwich, he has stepped up. He has bloody, bloody stepped up. He's been incredible. He's played almost every minute this season as well, which again is astonishing. For for a a midfielder to be able to play 46 games, he's only, I think it's just 30... For, try to do quick maths. Forty-three minutes he's he's um, he's missing out on to have played then played every minute. I think it's just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. But actually, his, te- his tempo setting, his tenacity, his defensive work break have all improved in that two-man anchor for Norwich City. In addition to being probably the most creative player in the division, he's averaged two point six key passes, which is putting chances on a plate. He is behind Sorba Thomas and Leif Davis, but they are set piece merchants. So take those set pieces out of it, their numbers may drop below Gabriel Sara. So Sara, for me, has been the most creative player in the division. And he, as I say, fully deserves it because he's, he's carried Norwich. He's carried Norwich. Yeah, I, I don't think yes. you're saying anything too outrageous there by saying that, Justin. Um, you did say ridiculous quite a lot there, but you are right. He has it's had ridiculous. a ridiculous season. The main reason why Norwich are a playoff side is because they've got two extremely talented players who should be in the Premier League in Gabriel Sara and Josh Sargent. And... Sergeant was unfortunately injured for half the season, but Sara still produced the goods in his absence. And I remember last season when he did join, he moved for six million. So there were high expectations for him, particularly at a club like Norwich, who don't often spend much money. And it took a while for him to get going. Then he had two months around the new year where he was absolutely unplayable. And then he went quiet again. So I didn't really know what to expect from him this season. But he has been unplayable in just about every game. He plays just like you want a Brazilian midfielder to play. Excellent dribbler, amazing chance creator, an eye for goal and can play those passes from deep too. Look, 13 goals and 12 assists is an unbelievable return from a player who's been playing most of the season as a number eight, not number 10. He's been playing deeper than that, much deeper. So that kind of return is outrageous and without giving anything away he has been in our conversation for player of the season anti Justin I think that's fair to say yeah without a shadow of doubt he's just been it's the consistency I think that's what gets you in the team of the season isn't it it's consistency there's no five or ten game spells it's being able to do it over 46 games he's done it over 46 games literally because he's played 46 games this season so there's no other player more deserving than a place in a team of the season than Gabriel Sara because you know, just a level of quality is his, his output has been he's been just incredible. It's been incredible, and you know 
like I was saying, you know, he wouldn't Norwich wouldn't be in that top six if it wasn't for him. To be really blunt and almost very rude, that Norwich team, there's nothing special about it without Gabriel Sara or Josh Sargent in it. I know Angus Gunn's in there as well, but he is a goalkeeper, so it's hard to make them look sexy. But Gabriel Sara made that team look sexy. Yeah, and even when Norwich were having their massive slump around autumn time, he was still producing the goods, wasn't he? Exactly. That's how good a player he is here. He's not the kind of player who needs the rest of the team to be playing well. He's the one who can change everything. Yeah. And that's just how good a player we're talking about right here. Let's go to, over to our other centre midfielder. And we've gone with Kieran Dewsbury Hall of Leicester City. Now, before the season even started, it was a safe bet Kieran Dewsbury Hall would feature in this team simply because he's arguably the most talented player in the championship he was being linked with some big clubs including Liverpool but he wanted to stay and get his boyhood side back into the Premier League and he has been the main reason behind them doing that 12 goals and 14 assists this season scored some very important goals in that time he has been the difference maker for Leicester even before their end of season slump they would have a few games where they weren't playing particularly well and Dewsbury Hall would come along and pull something out of the bag. But he is also the key cog in this Leicester side. If you think about it, Justin, how often have you watched Leicester this season where they've been on the counter-attack and Dewsbury Hall has been the one with the ball charging forward in a three-on-two situation or something like that? He... There's a reason why he's trusted in that situation because he's such a clever decision-maker and he's the heartbeat of this Leicester team. Leicester wouldn't have got promoted without Kenan Dewsbury Hall. I'm putting that out there right now. Probably not that big a statement to make because he is their best player. But he's individually won them at least 10 points this season, maybe even more than that. And he's a top-half Premier League player. And it's sad that, if reports are to be believed, Leicester are probably going to be forced to sell him this summer um, because that's a huge blow for Leicester in their um, survival hopes next season. And because he's a local lad as well, because he's been absolutely class for Leicester this season, I'd suggest (laughs) Yeah, he has. And it's worth throwing out again. I interviewed him a couple of years ago and he's a sound, sound human being. Really, really cool mm. human being um, back when he was on loan at Luton. But honestly, he's such a, he's such a good, just a, such a good guy, such a good, uh, such a good player, such an elegant footballer as well. And he's been such a privilege to, he's been such a privilege to watch him this season. Um, and, and, and you go back to sort of the start of the season and you're saying, uh, yeah, it almost backs up the statement of you saying Leicester wouldn't have got promoted without him. First game of the season against Coventry City, he scores a brace to turn the game around for Norwich and win. Uh, sorry, for Norwich for Leicester to win the game for Leicester, and that is just a, a testament to him and how he set a stall out for the season. And again, really important thing to mention about Leicester is that they, yes, they were very good at keeping the ball, but they didn't get going till 45, 50, 60 minutes. It wasn't until the second half where they turned it on, and it was usually Kieran and Drewsbury Hall flipping that switch and turning that team turn that team on so to speak and as I say for a player to be as good as he is in the championship he shouldn't have been he shouldn't have been at a a second tier level and um, he was but we got to watch him for a a season and um, I don't think we're going to be watching him in the championship again until he's about 35 yeah yeah I think that's fair to say do you think he'll uh, end up at a top half Premier League team next season I mean Spurs have been strongly linked with him recently as well yeah, I, I really do. I really do. You say top half team and mentioned Spurs in the same note, uh, same, same express. Uh, yes, same statement is is quite funny because um, they're not top half team. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm joking. I'm joking. But you are right. You are right. I think he will be. I'd be surprised if he doesn't end up at a top four team. To be honest with you, because he's just got that ability, and I think he's one of those players that if you bring him in, um, ease him into ease him into things. Um, sort of like the first six months of a season um, and then he you know, sort of takes takes hold he's got the technical quality he really has it's just about getting that killer mindset that you have for a top 14 Absolutely let's do some honourable mentions for centre midfield then and Ethan Ampadu of Leeds is definitely worth a shout we will um, put him in the category of midfielders unlike the EFL team of the season they decided <laughs> to put him in at centre back which we're still not over um, considering he has played the majority of his games in midfield this season um, both Ipswich's midfielders Sam Morsey and Massimo Luongo definitely worthy of a shout because they have been the beating heart of that Ipswich team and England's Ben Sheaf at Coventry as well definitely deserves a shout if it wasn't for injury I think he may have pushed Sarah and Dewsbury Hall quite close mm-hmm. in the uh, in the reckoning for this um, and Coventry may have even had a much better season than the one they've had so you know some 
brilliant players uh, in midfield this season. It was a very high calibre and it says a lot about Tewsbury Hall and Sara actually that uh, both these two are included in this team, I think anyway. Just then, let's go on to the right wing position. Who have we got there? Maybe the most controversial position because I think you could have chosen one of four or five players. It was, it's been a really high standard of wide player this season, but the one we've gone for is Morgan Whitaker at Plymouth. I think this one probably needs a little bit more explaining because the first half of the season, he was in, he was just astonishing. He was incredible. Second half, there was a drop-off alongside Plymouth's drop-off as well, but he was still scoring and assisting really important goals, like the winner against Wolverham, for example. But 19 goals and 8 assists in your first full season in the championship is truly, truly exceptional. And um, that level of consistency in a team who have just come up from the League One, who have been battling relegation, um, for for half of the season, I think is is you know it, it's really worthy of, of of something because you can compare him to other players in that position. Plymouth, Plymouth aren't batting in the same league as them. They're not. They've got to work a little bit harder. They've got to work a little bit differently. And I think Morgan Whitaker to be able to step up the way he did, um, uh, yeah, he's fully deserving that uh, of a place. Got a hat trick against Norwich in a six two win at home park earlier on in the season as well, which again I think is something that I completely forgot about until until reading back, but. Just a level of um, level of quality has come up um, uh, and played with. It's, it's been great. He's got the physique of a painter and decorator, for goodness sake. He shouldn't be playing at this level, just really tall and gangly. You know, the painter and decorator, he's got to get to the top of the walls, do yeah, the ceilings. It, it's not something that would really uh, fall in with me, but um, I, I, I can see what you mean. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a compliment, whatever the case. Look, considering only two players have scored more goals than him this season and he's one assist off having the same goals and assists as Crescencio Somerville, he had to be included in this team, particularly because he's done it all in a side who finished 21st. Mm -hmm. He's had a ridiculous season and the gloss kind of did get taken off a bit with the fact he's only scored twice in 15 games and you know that's coincided with Plymouth's drop-off as well. But I think it goes to show how good he was for the first 31 games and we shouldn't let recency bias get in the way here. Considering before joining Plymouth, he had played 58 games at championship level and only scored three goals. Most of those appearances were off the bench, but the point still stands. For him to have a season like this is absolutely mad. And he did have a loan spell at Plymouth last season where he did really well. So he clearly just enjoys being at the club. The astonishing thing, though, is how clinical he has been. He's been by far and away the player who's outscored his XG the most this season. Sorry if it's a bit technical, but he's scored 16 goals from an XG of 11. To put that into context, Adam Armstrong at Southampton scored 21 goals this season, but he's done it from an XG of 22. So a lot of the goals Whitaker has scored, he's had no right of scoring them. He's just been like a sniper. So a remarkable season, (laughs) particularly for someone who only cost Plymouth a million pounds. But... When a 23-year-old at, I think it's fair to say, an unfashionable side in Plymouth, scores as many goals as him, it's always going to attract plenty of interest from elsewhere and Plymouth will do well to hold on to him this summer, Justin. That's fair, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it really is. It really is. I think, I mean, it's going to take a big money big money offer to try and prize him away from Plymouth because he's been that good. He's been that bloody good. But I think the important thing you've got to, you've got to really sort of hone in on is he wasn't fancied by Derby or Swansea in the championship. He loaned out to Lincoln, loaned out to Plymouth, and it took this maybe a bit of a risk for Plymouth to spend a lot of money from their own standards on a player who has record signing Justin. Exactly. Who hasn't had a who hasn't had a full season at championship level. Big, big risk. But he's come in, he's delivered. And Plymouth have stayed up in the championship. So that investment, quite small in you know, in the grand scheme of the championship, but what an investment it was. Absolutely. Honourable mentions then for right wing Abdul Fatawu at Leicester. Remarkable season from such a young lad. And then Johnny Rowe at Norwich as well. Another great season. Um, let's go on to our number 10, Justin. We've gone for a 4-2-3-1 in our team of the season. And in that number 10 role is none other than Sammy Schmodix at Blackbird. Now, Anyone who ever fancies a bet here or there, you should have gotten Sammy Spodix at the start of the season to be top goal scorer. He's what he was one hundred and fifty to one to win top goal scorer. I'll be stunned if there's many people who have actually had a bet <laughs> on him there. But what makes what makes it all the more incredible um, is the fact that he's finished as top goal scorer and by quite a distance. Yeah, twenty seven yeah, yeah, yeah. league goals for this campaign. Before this season, he had scored eleven goals in seventy three championship appearances. 
it's not bad, but it's nothing remarkable. And now he's more than trebled that tally after one season. It's just mad, but also a wonderful story. Because, look, here's this guy who was playing in League Two until the age of 24. Went to Bristol City, where he never got a look in. Went to Peterborough, but couldn't stop them going down. Goes to Blackburn, he was all right in his first season. And then this season finishes as top goal scorer with 27 goals. Six clear of second place. And that's a bloody good tally, by the way. You know, the, the likes of Alexander Mitrovic may have distorted goal tallies in a championship season after their recent feats. But when you remember only three players in championship history have scored 30 goals or more, 27 for a season is bloody good going. So what a wonderful year it's been for him. And I will be honest, I don't know where it's come from. I'm not sure anyone does, but he's had the season of his life, hasn't he? This has been for a team that's been struggling for the entire season, by the yeah. way. They've been <laughs> down at the bottom of the, uh, in the bottom half of the table for 60, 70% of the season. It's been an incredible rise. But I think the, the big thing here is, uh, I don't know if it's good coaching or just Samish Modic's just picking things up um, and, and doing things a little bit differently from his own perspective because his, his, his type of goals, his standard of runs, are just copy and paste. Copy and paste. Peel off the right side of centre back in between the right back, getting that gap, a bit like Michael Owen back in his heyday, you know, getting between the getting between the full back and the centre back and just make those runs off um, off of them and essentially dink the ball around the goalkeeper, side footing, um, you know, and bending it around the goalkeeper. It's just copy and paste, rinse and repeat, same old, same old. And he did it time and time again and no team's cotton on to it. It was just so bloody good at it. And I was just looking here, I just wanted to check out how many offsides. He accumulated uh, last season. He accumulated the most offsides with 43. 12 more than Hadji Wright, who was second, and, and Sinclair Armstrong, who was third. That's an, incre- <laughs> an incredible amount of um, offsides. But that's because he was gambling on making those runs time and time again. And it paid off because he scored 27 goals. He's a division's top goal scorer. And, um, you know, not a conventional striker either. I don't know what position you class him as playing this season, whether it was a false nine, whether it was a number 10. Doesn't matter. He scored a lot of goals for Blackburn and he, he kept them in the championship. Yeah. And what was the stat we had at the weekend as well? He's the lowest ranking top goal scorer yeah. in the cha- in the second tier since the turn of the century. When I say lowest ranking, I mean where his team has finished. Yeah. And that says a lot, doesn't it, about how, you know, he hasn't had the greatest of supply lines. And so for him to get 27 goals is just mind-blowing, really. Honourable mentions then for the number 10 role. Connor Chaplin at Ipswich, I think, was very unfortunate that he was behind Sammy Schmodix because I I was really keen for another Ipswich player to get into this team, spoiler alert. Um, and I'm quite frustrated that we've only got the one, but, you know, it was really difficult to fit anyone else in. Connor Chaplin was probably the next most worthy. Yeah. Unfortunately, he's behind Sammy Schmodix, who's just had the most ridiculous of seasons. So, unfortunate for him, um, but I think a Chaplin could still put this down as a pretty remarkable season in his own right. Justin, let's go to left wing. Who have we got there in our team of the season? We have another Leeds player and it's Crescentio Somerville. Like I was saying about Morgan Whitaker, there's been such a high standard of wide players this season. So many have hit double figure goals. So many have got close to scoring 20 goals this season. And Crescentio Somerville is one of those players. It's just been um, a remarkable uh, return for him. 19 goals from a wide player, nine assists is magnificent and he's had to step up you know he was a bit part player for Leeds in in the Premier League he's still still very very young but just the level of consistency he's delivered I know there's been drops off at times but you're going to get that with wide players um but he's just just so consistent he's so consistent with 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 the goals he scores he averaged the fifth most dribbles per game last season uh, well during the season as well which is a you know an astonishing stat because teams teams sat back against Leeds. They needed the individual quality to bring him through games and Somerville delivered that. And uh, I think the reason why I, I wanted him in this team is because every time I watched him play, it just feels like everything's slowing down around him. Everything slows down around him and he just does what he needs to do to to, to, to get to the end goal as to whatever that is, whether it's a key pass, goal, assist, doesn't matter. It just feels like everything slows down. He's such a, such a gifted footballer. I'm really looking forward to seeing how he develops. He won't want to be playing in a championship next season, so he's got to got to deliver for Leeds in the playoffs. Yeah, well, even if they get promoted, I don't think he'll be staying at Ellen Road, unfortunately <laughs> for them. Um, 
because look, Somerville's another one who's firmly in the category of should be in the Premier League. At times this season, it's been a bit embarrassing watching him in the Championship because it's like the opposition just aren't worthy to be playing against him. He's just an unbelievable talent and it's no surprise that plenty of Champions League sides have been linked with him in the summer. He, he goes past defenders like it's nothing and it's quite spectacular how often we've seen him you know, cutting from the left and curl one into the far right corner. A strange thing is with Leeds. Despite all their attacking talent, they've been a bit over-reliant on Somerville on occasion. Yeah. Now, if I was in Daniel Farker's shoes, I would also be telling my players to give the ball to Somerville as much as possible too. But that has been part of their downfall because when he hasn't performed, Leeds haven't performed. And it's, you know, it's unrealistic to expect him to, you know, pull something out of the bag every single game but he's done it on so many occasions um, that it's still quite unhuman he has been unstoppable particularly around the end of 2023 defenders could not deal with him and he, he he's simply been a cheat code in the championship the crazy thing is with him he's only 22 it's easy to forget because he broke onto the scene at Leeds three years ago. So it just emphasises that he's got a big future ahead of him. Would you agree with that, Justin? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. Oh, my God. Yes, he has. <laughs> yes, he has got a big future ahead of him. This is what I mean. Like, he was a bit of a bit part player. And sometimes players need um, a consistent run of games. And like I said, you, you, you're taking on the number 10 shirt in, uh, for Leeds. It's a big responsibility for any player, I think, to take on. Yeah, a squad number of that's I don't know if squad numbers have a big thing now nowadays or all the kids you know are big on squad numbers but you know, I feel like the number 10 shirt still carries some gravitas mm. so to you know to take it on to take that responsibility of being a key player and delivering I think is a, a testament to him as a player and as I say still so young still really young uh, you know, and it's to be that consistent at that age, I think is a very difficult thing to do, and he's done it. I think that highlights what a special player he is and what a special season he's had. Yeah, and to highlight his performances this season, left wing was a really competitive position, wasn't it? Really it? Was. As far as teams, team of the season goes, and that with the honourable mentions, it goes to show just how good he has been. That he was quite easily ahead of these because, like Jack Clark, for example, at Sunderland has had a brilliant season. Of course, his performances have dropped with Sunderland, but still, he's been fantastic for them this season. And Jaden Filagine as well at Hull. Great season. Hadji Wright at Coventry, usually a striker, but has played the majority of his games now mm -hmm. as a left winger. Um, he's had a great season as well, but none of them have come close to Crescencio Zumovil, which I think goes to say a lot about him. The final, player, the final player in our team of the season then, and of course, it's the striker. We've gone with Adam Armstrong at Southampton. And the simple reason is this. No player has contributed to more goals in the entire football league this season than Adam Armstrong. 21 goals and 13 assists. He's actually up there for the most goal contributions ever in a championship season, which makes it all the more bizarre that he was left out of the official EFL team of the season. You know, we're not letting this lie, EFL. Your team of the season was complete and utter tin pot compared to ours. Um, I'm not sure what more he could have done to be included. And he's simply been a difference maker for Southampton. It's, it's, it's something they've struggled with all season, isn't it? You know, we all know they have plenty of possession, but converting it into goals has been a problem at times. Yeah. Not with Adam Armstrong, who's simply relished being back in the Championship. Now, I, I do have a fear with him that he falls into the Dwight Gale paradox of being unbelievable in the Championship but not good enough for the Premier League. He scored 65 goals in his last 132 Championship games compared to just four in 53 in the Prem. But let's not let that get in the way of what a season he's had. You've got to give him full credit. And the scary thing is, I'm not sure where Southampton would have been without him this season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting one to, to consider. And I think as well, maybe it was a bit of a gamble relying on him because I think he's come down from the Premier League where he's not really made that step up and he's coming down, in, you know, he's coming back into a, to a league where he does score regularly. But he's also, you could argue, been incredibly wasteful for Blackburn in previous years when he was, you know, before he moved to Southampton. I, I think I was a big critic of him. I even argued with his dad at one point on Twitter yeah. <laughs> because I, I suggested that his, his, his decision-making in front of goal wasn't good enough. Um, and it, you know the, the volume of shots he was taking was was so so many, just inevitable. The amount of goals he was going to score was going to add up. But he's changed that this season. He's been clinical. He's been, you know, he's, he's he's got that. 
you know, aggressive nature in front of goal where decision making is a lot more fluent, a lot more um, ag- aggressive and clinical. And you need that, I think, to be in that Southampton team because they, they do create chances, but getting in those areas and, and, and throwing leads away, they're very good at. They're very good at. So scoring a lot of goals they need to. And Adam Armstrong has delivered not only in assists and goals as well. But that those numbers that you were mentioning in terms of his goal contributions this season, um, I think it's just absolutely astonishing. I, I looked at it just before just before we came on air and I, my jaw dropped because you see goals and assists in a separate in separate columns and you think, okay, just twenty one goals and um and thirteen odd assists and it's just like, okay, it's fine. But then you see them together and it's just like, Jesus Christ, man, you are unreal. You have been unreal this season. And that's Adam Armstrong and a big credit to him for stepping up. Yeah, massive credit to him. Um, Honourable mentions up front, you know, some some top quality strikers in the championship this season. Josh Sargent at Norwich, Justin. If he wasn't injured for half the season, it would have been very interesting to see how many goals he would have scored. Yes. And, you know, it would have made it even tougher to call between him and Adam Armstrong in our team of the season. I can tell you that much for sure. And then Jorginho Ruta as well. Fair play to him. He is... He, He's a bit of a strange one because he's probably had the best season a striker can possibly have while only scoring six goals. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But well, he's just been so effective in creating chances and assists as well. He's got 15 assists for the season. So um, if, he was, uh, if he wasn't so wasteful in front of goal, which he definitely has been yes, this season, yes, yes. then he could have had an absolutely mind-blowing season in his own right. But he still had a really, really good season. Don't get me wrong. So, yeah, Adam Armstrong, compared to some of the strikers we've just mentioned there, you know, it, it's, it's worth mentioning. Again, it goes to show that considering he was a fair distance ahead of them in terms of our striker for our team of the season, just how good a season he has had. And there we go, ladies and gentlemen. This has been our team of the season in the Championship for the 23 24 season just before we go just and we should probably just rattle through them and remind the listeners who we have got in each position so first off who have we got in goal justin we've got angus gunn of norwich and at right back we have cal walker peters of southampton and we've got joe roden at center back at leeds yannick vestergaard is his center half partner from leicester completing the defense leave davis at left back of his which town in midfield we have gabriel sara of norwich and we've got Kean and Jusbury Hall of Leicester partnering Gabriel Sara in central midfield. We absolutely have a right wing. We have Morgan Whitaker of Plymouth. And at left wing, we've got Crescentio Somerville of Leeds. Number 10 is Sammy Schmodz of Blackburn, the championship top goal scorer. And rounding off our team is Adam Armstrong in the number nine position of Southampton. What a team. Hey, I think that's a, I oof. think that's a pretty good team and big you know, levels. I'm sure you'll get quite a bit of a feedback from our dear listeners on social media, but I genuinely think we've absolutely nailed that there, Justin. And you know what? It's not the end of the award season for us, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow we have our second tier awards. So player of the season, young player of the season, permanent signing of the season, loan signing of the season, goal of the season, and of course, manager of of the season. All of the seasons will be announced tomorrow. So we look forward to seeing you then, ladies and gentlemen, to, you know, have another episode where we go through the best of the championship this past season. So we look forward to seeing you then. This has been the Second Tier Podcast. I've been Ryan Dilks. I've been Justin Peach. And a big thank you for listening.